This is your USMNT Abroad weekend update from December 10th to December 12th of 2021. Hi, if you're new here, I'm Filippo and welcome to Document TV and welcome to another USMNT Abroad episode where every Monday we update you on how the Yanks did abroad over the weekend and every Friday we update you on how the Yanks did abroad over the midweek. Now for this video, I have a challenge for you. Yes, for you. If we can hit 800 likes in this video, I will be doing a live stream between Christmas and New Year's a USMNT awards live stream. And I will bring a special guest. I'll do my best to bring a special guest and I'll make sure to be creative about it. But we do need to hit 800 likes in this video. It truly helps the algorithm and helps the channel. So don't forget to do that. And again, over the course of Christmas and New Year's, we will be taking it easy here in the channel, but I will be doing that for the viewers if we hit 800 likes. That's it, everyone. Let's play the intro, of course, and hit the like button. And let's start with the performance updates. So usually before I start the performance updates, I do transfer rumors, but there's been so many fake transfer rumors out there that I'm going to avoid that for now. I'm not trying to become a meme like ESPN or CBS or all of that, that they reported in the Mexican, the Mexican media, media as well. They, well, they reported, reported some, some fake transfer, transfer rumors. I don't want to become that. There have been rumors about the ODK going to West Brom, all that. I'm going to avoid it for now until I have concrete evidence. But that said, let's start with the performance updates with Christian Pulisic from Chelsea. On Saturday, Pulisic stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes for Chelsea during their 3-2 victory over Leeds United. Not much to talk about here. Chelsea does have a busy schedule, though, for the rest of 2021. They will be playing five games in a span of 15 days. With that said, Pulisic will likely play, so don't get discouraged. I mean, <laughs> I hope he plays. Now, to address the Pulisic must leave Chelsea argument. <sighs> Look, it's undeniable that Thomas Tuchel's system works wonders for the team and it benefits a few players from Chelsea while hurting others. Yes, um, Thomas Tuchel's system works for some and doesn't for others. Clearly, it's not the best fit for Christian Pulisic. And if you look at it, it works better for Timo Werner than it does for Lukaku. And Lukaku is a far better center forward than Timo Werner. With that said, everyone, my opinion on it, Christian Pulisic should just stay at Chelsea if there's no good offers right now in January, which probably there won't. No one can afford him in January. The transfer budgets are low unless it's Newcastle, but I don't want that. With that said, what I'm trying to say is I'm okay with Pulisic staying till the summer, trying to earn his spot in Chelsea. And if it's still the same situation by the summer, leave, go somewhere else. Okay, that's my take on Pulisic for now. It can change. That's just right now. Let me know yours. Quick update on Weston McKinney and Giovanni Reina. They're still injured. They're both day-to-day. -day. They're both training, apparently. Weston McKinney with the knee injury and, and Gio Reina had that muscle injury a while back, all the way in the September camp. So they should be back early 2022. I think both teams will rest them through the winter break and early January they'll be back, hopefully healthy and good to go for the January camp with the U.S. Men's National Team. I don't care much about Juventus and Dortmund. I just want them ready for the World Cup qualifying against the rude Canadians. Okay, now Serginho Dest from Barcelona and Barcelona titles as soon as 2-2 over the weekend and Dest got zero minutes. He stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes. Now, Barcelona honestly got lucky on this one. Their second goal, in my opinion, should have been disallowed. It was a handball on the defensive end from Sergio Busquets. They should have disallowed the goal and gave a PK to Osasuna, which would have changed the course of the entire game. Osasuna got a late goal, tied the game. Dest didn't play. So this time, Xavi can't blame Dest. The Barcelona press, the Catalonia press can't blame Dest even though they always try to. Or, or maybe they'll find a way to blame Dest anyway. But Dest didn't play. It looks like he could leave in January. The possibility is real. And we made a video about that. Now, Joe Scali from Borussia Mönchengladbach and Tyler Adams from RB Leipzig, as they did face each other over the weekend. And there's three things certain in life. Death, taxes, and Joe Scali starting for Borussia Mönchengladbach. And probably a fourth one, me butchering a German name. On Saturday, Joe Scali started and went the full 90 minutes for Gladbach, while Tyler Adams started off on the bench for Leipzig and came in at the 71st minute at Leipzig's 4-1 win over Gladbach. And yes, Leipzig did get a 4-1 win, and that is not a good look for Gladbach, as they did lose on the last weekend 6-0 to Freiburg. The weekend before that, they lost to Clone 4-1. And okay, okay, before that, they did defeat Firth 4-0 before this awful stretch. But I mean, Firth, that just doesn't count. Yeah, it it's hard to believe that this Gladbach team is the one that's been giving Bayern trouble all season long. They've just looked terrible the last three games of a 4-1 loss, 6-0 loss, and then a 4-1 loss again. 
Joe Scali played this one as a right back. They did change their formation from earlier this season where they would go with three center backs. They went with a back four and Joe Scali was the right back. Prior to this game, I was excited about the matchup between the two former New York City FC players. Congratulations to NYC FC fans, by the way, for the MLS Cup title. And by that, I mean Joe Scali and Angelino. The second goal scored by Leipzig, Scali did have some blame. Kinda, sorta had some blame. Let me explain. Scali should have closed the gap between him and Angelino rather than marked the ball. But the reason Scali had a tuck in was because Zakaria was poorly positioned in the midfield, forcing Scali to go a bit central and give more space for Angelino. And that time and space that was given was enough for him to hit the cross that would assist Leipzig's second goal. Now, this was actually a tactical mistake from Gladbach that happened quite a bit in the first half and they kept forcing Scali to drift in and it made it look like he was getting owned by Angelino. Not to say that Scali was good, but most of the time it wasn't his mistakes in terms of Angelino having such a good half. Now for the second half, due to technical difficulties from ESPN, FC or ESPN Plus, I wasn't able to watch it. So they had technical difficulties. You just can't trust big media, even for the little things. But Leipzig did win 4-1, another win, which is not a good look for Jesse Marsh. They have been doing much better since he was gone, and even Andre Silva is scoring. Scali for this game had one clearance, three interceptions, two tackles, won six out of eight ground duels, had 50 touches, and an 80% passing accuracy. Now, Tyler Adams, despite only playing 19 minutes, he still got 15 touches, 58% passing accuracy, won one out of two ground duels, and won all of his two uh, aerial duels. All right, now it's the time of the video where we go by position. And the first one will be the goalkeepers. But before we start the goalkeepers, don't forget to hit the like button. We do need to hit 800 likes for that awesome, great live stream that we're going to have at the end of the year. And I start to figure out who am I bringing in. But goalkeeper Zach Steffen stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes for Manchester City over the weekend. Nothing new right there. Ederson is the lock-in starter. If Ederson's healthy, Zach Steffen doesn't play. Now, Nottingham Forest, Ethan Horvath was again on the bench the full 90 minutes. A transfer that made absolutely no sense for me from Ethan Horvath. Went from one bench to another. Alex Maiten, that's not a goalkeeper, but also plays for Nottingham Forest. Stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes for Nottingham Forest for that match as well okay moving on the video now john brooks from most because we're going to do the center backs and john brooks is going a bit through a rough phase on Saturday, Brooks stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes for Wolfsburg during their 2-0 loss to Stuttgart. There were reports this week that I need to talk about mentioning Brooks having attitude problems, saying that cost his spot with the U.S. men's national team, that he was having issues with Greg. And I mean, Brooks and Greg did say otherwise when he didn't get called up last camp, right? So do we believe that? I don't know. Now, John Brooks has also been having problems with his contract renewal that expires at the end of the season with Wolfsburg. It's just weird, man. You know, let's also wait and see for the official reports and what the players and managers have to say. Otherwise, this might just all be gossip. I'll tell you one thing, though. It does seem like some people, maybe in the media, maybe people with USSF, they're trying to push almost a narrative that Greg and Brooks don't get along. Is it true or not? I don't know. It just seems like this narrative is trying to be pushed very hard. I just don't know the reasons. Regardless, it's been a very turbulent season for John Brooks. Unlike last season, which was a very smooth ride and Brooks was in form and Wolfsburg was doing well and he was good for the U.S. men's national team, this season has been rough on John Brooks. One of our best, if not our best center back. I'm sorry, it, he still is, but it's been terrible for him this season. <sighs> Hopefully he recovers from it. Now, Chris Richards. From Hoffenheim. On Saturday, Richards started and went the full 90 minutes for Hoffenheim during their big away win against Freiburg. Two Hoffenheim, one Freiburg. Now, Chris Richards played as a left center back for this one, and he was great in this match in the buildup, showing all his class and ability to play with both feet. He was a true ball playing defender, as he always is, even helping on the buildup for their first goal scored. Now, the goal scored by Freiburg, he had no fault of his own. However, during the first half, he did have a bit of a scary moment where he got hit pretty hard in the face, but luckily he was just fine. Now let's talk about the big moment of this match for Chris Richards. Actually, a big moment for his career. He scored his first Bundesliga goal. And this was when Chris Richards scored the game-winning goal at added time, essentially a buzzer beater in basketball terms to get Hoffenheim the win. And what a way to score your first Bundesliga goal, a huge, massive win. Essentially, this was the tactical effect with some lag, as our interview's been a few weeks. So it was just a little delayed, but the tactical effect has finally arrived. 
Chris Richards' goal moved Hoffenheim to fourth place in Bundesliga, and they are now currently in the UEFA Champions League qualification zone. For this match, Chris Richards had 80 touches, 79% passing accuracy. He hit four out of 10 long balls accurately and had one shot on target. Well, the goal. He won four out of 13 ground duels, which is not good if we're going to be honest. But the big surprise here was he had absolutely no ground duels. A massive weekend for Chris Richards. All right, now, Matt Miazga, quick update on him. He was not with Deportivo Alaves over the weekend because he tested positive for COVID, so he's currently quarantining. We're wishing Matt Miazga a speedy recovery. Now let's go to Mark McKenzie from Genk. On Sunday, McKenzie started and went to full 90 minutes for Genk during their 1-0 loss to Ghent in the Belgium League. Yes, it was Genk versus Ghent, I think think I got their name right. For this one, McKenzie had three clearances, three interceptions, one tackle, and one dribble passed, along with 56 touches and the 93% passing accuracy, which is pretty high. Now, it seems like Mark McKenzie is picking up some good momentum, which he was struggling in Belgium earlier on, but the last three matches he started went the full 90 minutes and had solid performances, so that's pretty good news. Hopefully, he locks in a starting job in Genk very soon, if he hasn't already. Okay, now let's talk about a center back that is in very much good form. And that's Cameron Carter Vickers from Celtic in Scotland. On Sunday, CCV started and went the full 90 minutes for Celtic during their 1-0 victory over Motherwell. Another clean sheet for CCV and the Celtic defense. And Cameron Carter Vickers had actually a monster performance, at least in terms of stats. Now look, I didn't watch the game and obviously you can't judge one's performance just based off stats. But based off these stats and having a clean sheet and how he's been playing... It seems like he had a monster performance, but let's look into these stats. Cameron Carter Vickers had seven clearances, which is pretty high, two block shots, three interceptions, one tackle, won two out of four ground duels, won 11 out of 13 aerial duels, which is massive, had 103 touches, which is pretty high as well, and an 81% passing accuracy. All right, so we're moving on in the field. Now we're going to go to the fullbacks, and let's start with the Fulham boys, Anthony Robinson and Tim Ream. On Saturday, Tim Ream started and went the full 90 minutes while Robinson stayed on the bench the full 90 for Fulham during their 1-1 drop with Luton Town. Now, Robinson is a starter, but apparently he has been dealing with an injury, might not be 100% fit. That is why he probably didn't play this one. Now, in regards to Fulham, they have tied their past four games, so they are in poor form. However, they are still leading the English Championship by two points and on track to return to the English Premier League. Next on the list is Reggie Cannon from Boa Vista in Portugal. On Saturday, Cannon started off the bench and came in at the 64th minute for Boa Vista during their 2-0 loss to Sporting at Liga NOS. Next is Sam Vines from Royal Antwerp in Belgium. On Sunday, Vines started and went the full 90 minutes for Antwerp during their 3-2 loss to Standard Liège. The last fullback that I want to talk about, but before we do that, don't forget the 800 like challenge. Hopefully you hit it by now. And throw a comment in there just for the YouTube algorithm. But the last fullback I want to talk about is Shaq Moore from Tenerife at La Liga 2. And I know, we haven't been talking about him in a while, so I thought I would update you on him today. On Saturday, Shaq Moore started and played 71 minutes for Tenerife during their 1-1 drop with Lugo at La Liga 2. Tenerife currently sits in 4th place at La Liga 2, fighting for a spot to get promoted to La Liga. Now let's move on to the midfielders. And let's start with Yunus Musa from Valencia that he kind of played this weekend. On Saturday, Yunus Musa started off of the bench and pretty much stayed there the entire match as he only came in at the 90th minute for Valencia during their 2-1 victory over Elche. So besides being a time-wasting technique, I think these last minute subs are pointless. Next on the list are the ones from Venezia. This Beautiful jersey, by the way. Tanner Tessman and Gianluca Busio from Venezia. On Saturday, Busio started and went the full 90 minutes for Venezia during their 1-1 draw with Juventus. Big draw, if you ask me. Tanner Tessman for this one started off on the bench and came in at the 64th minute. Yes, Juve are not the powerhouse they used to be, but this was a big tie for Venezia. Every point is very much needed for them to escape relegation, and Juventus is still one of the top teams in the Serie A. For this one, Busio played as an 8 as a central midfielder in a 4-3-3 formation. Once Tanner Tessman came in, Busio stayed in the same position, and Tanner Tessman played as a 6, a.k.a. a defensive midfielder. And Busio, in my opinion, had a very good game 
against one tough opponent. Jonah Cabusio for this one had 64 touches, 81.8% passing accuracy, one key pass, one shot on target, one eight out of 11 ground duels, also adding five tackles. Now, Tanner Tessman, he had less minutes, but he still was able to pull a few defensive stats. He got one clearance and two block shots as well. At their age and what they're doing in the city, especially Gianluca Busio, it's quite impressive. And I don't know, Busio is probably going to get a big move in a season or two if he continues this improvement that it, we're seeing every single game on the ball, off the ball, more aggressive, more physical than ever. It's been quite impressive, quite a ride. And I'm not just saying this because I'm wearing his jersey. I think he's actually been quite impressive. Next on the list is the Argentine-American Alan Sonora from Independiente. On Sunday, Alan Sonora started and went to full 90 minutes for Independiente during their 2-1 win over Talleres. For the first half, he was wide out left at the defensive shape, but he would be all over the place on the offense, pretty much playmaking. Not sure if the coach is just giving him the freedom or he just lacks tactical discipline. Personally, I think he's given the freedom based on my eye test and plus the coach kept him in the field for the full 90 so he's probably following the instructions at the second half it was probably similar in my opinion as well in the sense of positioning but he did seem to gas out at one point for Independiente, the first goal they got in this match from this 2-1 win was off a of PK, and that PK was drawn by Alan Senora. He shot the ball, and it hit the opponent's hand, so we could say he did draw the PK. This was the last game of the Argentine season. Independiente has qualified to the Copa Sudamericana, which is the Europa League of South America. Now, Christian Capis from Bromby. On Sunday, Capis started and was subbed off at halftime with a yellow card for Bromby during their 2-1 win over Midgeland. Now, when he was subbed off, the game was tied 1-1 at the time. Now, Brendan Aronson from RB Salzburg for now. On Saturday, Brendan started and went the full 90 minutes for RB Salzburg during their 5-0 win over Watkins. Brendan had one heck of a game with 52 touches, 82% passing accuracy, six key passes, which is really high, one assist, two big chances created, won all two of his ground duels, and won two out of seven aerial duels, but you know, headers aren't this thing anyway. There has also been rumors of him being linked to AC Milan, and I think Brendan has made his case this season of making a big move to a top five league. He will finish the season with Salzburg, I hope, playing the Champions League knockout rounds as they have qualified for the first time in their history, and then probably make a move over the summer. Personally, I would love to see him go to AC Milan. I don't know. I think he could fight for a starting job there, and it would be a big jump for Brendan. I think he's up for the challenge. I would love to see that. But you know, let me know what you think. Would you like to see Brendan make that jump over the summer and head to AC Milan? I'm just asking you because I'd like to know your opinion as well. Now let's go to Tim Tillman and Julian Green from Firth. On Sunday, Tim Tillman started and played 86 minutes for Firth while Julian Green stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes. Now, believe it or not, Firth actually won this game. <laughs> yes. They won this game. And if that's not enough of a reason of you for you to hit that like button, I don't know what is enough of a reason. So they defeated Union Berlin 1-0. to zero. This win comes a week after I called them the worst team in Bundesliga history. I'm still sticking to that, to be honest. But a big congratulations to Firth. They got their first win of the season. Now let's go to Luca De La Torre from Heracles. On Sunday, De La Torre started and went to full 90 minutes for Heracles during their 2-1 loss to Vitesse. For this one, Luca got a yellow card, had 61 touches, 85% passing accuracy, had 4 out of 4 successful dribbling attempts, won 6 out of 9 ground duels, and won the 1 aerial duel that he had. However, for the PK that Vitesse scored their second goal, Luca De La Torre was the one that committed the penalty kick. So... That was a negative from his performance, which led to their loss. The way Heracles plays requires a lot of defense from Luca Del Toy. Plus, he keeps showing that he can be very effective at progressing the ball forward and in transition. I personally think he'd be a great eight for the U.S. men's national team. But honestly, from what I'm seeing, he could even possibly be a backup six if needed. Since we already have Weston, Musa as eight options, even Reina, Busio. What I'm saying is, I'm not saying Luca Del Toy is a six. He has been playing as a dual pivot six. I'm saying that I'm open to the possibility of seeing him play as a backup six. That's all I'm saying. Now, Ian Harks from Dundee United. On Saturday, Ian Harks started and went the full 90 minutes for Dundee United during their 1-0 loss to Livingston in the Scottish Premiership. 
Next on the list, Dwayne Holmes from Huddersfield. On Saturday, Holmes started and pretty much went the full 90 as he was subbed off at added time, got a yellow card during Huddersfield's 1-1 drop with Coventry. The last midfielder I want to talk about is Richie Ledesma from PSV. And what I want to say about him real quick, he stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes with the senior squad, so he's no longer of young PSV. He's with the senior team of PSV. And PSV is a pretty damn strong squad. They're leading Eredivisie, the Dutch league, ahead of Ajax. So just the fact that returning from an ACL injury, he's already able to make the bench. Congratulations to Richie Ledesma. Quite impressive and one of our top prospects. Okay, now we're going to go to the forwards and we're going to start with Timothy Weah from Lille. And I hate to bring you bad news, but unfortunately, we got bad news. It's been reported that due to a muscle injury, Weah is out for the rest of the month, which means at the, the earliest he would return would be January of 2022, which could affect his status for the World Cup qualifying. Worries me a little bit because we do have the rude Canadians that we're going to face in January. That is a very important match for all of us because we do need to humble them. But hopefully Way is back early in January and good to go by the end of it. Now, Conrad de la Fuente from Olympique Marseille. On Sunday, Conrad did not dress for this one. Was not with the team. Last match, he did seem to leave with some pain, but nothing was reported. Maybe he's dealing with a minor injury. We don't know. He was probably just rested for this one. We'll keep you all posted. I do expect him to be ready for their next game unless some reports comes out telling us he's actually injured. Now, Nico Gioacchini from Montpellier. On Saturday, Gioacchini came off the bench at the 77th minute for Montpellier during their 4-0 win over Brest. For this one, Nico had an amazing assist, which honestly, the goal was 80% him. He carries the ball from the defensive end all the way to the final third in transition to assist his teammate for the fourth goal. Joaquini has been slowly adjusting to his new club and new league because he was at the second division of France. And I would not be surprised if he has a very strong second half of the season. And I hope to see him at World Cup qualifying at one point, even though I'm not overly optimistic in regards to that. Now, Josh Sargent and John Tomlinson. On Saturday, Sargent started and went the full 90 minutes for Norwich during their 1-0 loss to Manchester United. Now, Sargent played as a left winger, and just like most of the Norwich side, he had a good game, in my opinion. Again, no goals, no assists, the usual for Josh Sargent, but he played well, to be honest. He created opportunities for his teammates. Defensively, he was pretty good for Norwich as well. The pressing was good. I have been heavily critical of him in the past performances, but this one, he was fine. Sargent had 39 touches, 88.9% passing accuracy, one key pass, won three out of eight ground duels, lost all of his aerial duels, and had three clearances. Now, I want to give a shout out to Jonathan Tomlinson as well, that he made the bench for Norwich for the first time, the 19-year-old American center back, which was previously with the Norwich U23s and now is with the senior squad. Personally, <laughs> the funny part of the game was seeing... Chris Armas with Ralph Ragnick at Manchester United. You know, as a Manchester United fan and someone here following MLS, I never thought this day would come. But congratulations to Chris Armas. It was very odd to see that happen. Congratulations to him. Um, and I'm wishing him the best. But there's, I don't know, I think Toronto FC fans can most certainly relate to this. Now, PFOC from BSC Young Boys in Switzerland. On Sunday, PFOC started and played a full 90 minutes for BSC Young Boys during their 4-3 win over Sion. Surprisingly, he got no goals or assists for this one despite going the full 90 and them having four goals. Now, Tyler Boyd from Rizespor. On Saturday, Tyler Boyd started and played 71 minutes for Rizespor during their 3-1 win over Guts Tepe. I definitely butchered that Turkish name. I apologize for my Turkish viewers. He has been heavily linked to LA Galaxy and he is currently on a loan. So it's unlikely that we'll see him leave mid-season Rizespor as they do battle against relegation. But we could see him joining the Galaxy during this summer of 2022. Now, Emmanuel Sabi from Odense at Denmark. On Sunday, Sabi started and scored for Odense during their 2-1 loss to Reinders in the Danish League. Oh, yeah, sorry, and he played the full 90 minutes. Now let's go to Christian Ramirez that plays in Scotland. On Saturday, Ramirez started and went the full 90 minutes for Aberdeen during their 1-0 win over St. Johnston in the Scottish Premiership. He also got a yellow card for this one. All right, everyone, that does it for this one. And don't forget to hit the like button so we hit 800 likes. For the week of Christmas and New Year's, I just want to give everyone a heads up. The channel will be way less active as me and Dustin will be taking a break of roughly a week. We'll probably do that live stream. That'll be very fun if we hit 800 likes in this video. But besides that, the videos, the abroad series, everything will probably be down a little bit as we're going to be enjoying our families and just resting up because 2022 will be a very big year for the U.S. men's national team community, all of us together. I want to thank you all very much for watching, guys. Hit the like button before we go. 
And thank you really from the bottom of our hearts, all the support you guys have been giving this entire year. I know we're getting to the end of the year and we want to thank you for that. There's going to be more episodes this week, the Bosnia preview, the Bosnia watch along, but I just want to show how grateful I am and Dustin is for you guys as well. Thank you very much for watching everyone and have a great day.